Good morning. Happy to see you guys here this morning for our Triscoll lesson, December the 12th, 2021. I'm Latrivia Easton here with St. Andrew's African Methodist Episcopal Church here in Sacramento, California, where the Reverend Philip R. Cousin Jr. is our pastor. We are in the second lesson on our quarter justice law history. And we're in the second lesson of our first unit, God Requires Justice. If you have your Precepts for Living Study Guide, grab it and turn to the lesson for December the 12th. Our lesson title today is David Administers Justice and Kindness. And we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Our lesson aim, as stated in our study guide, is to explore David's kindness towards Mephibosheth as an act of justice and equity. Reflect on the value of keeping your word and show radical kindness to someone in need. Let's pray. Lord God, we just praise you and we thank you, Lord God, for your word. We praise you and we thank you for this lesson. We praise you and I thank you for all the things that you have for us this morning. Lord God, you are a just God and you are a merciful God and you are a good, good father. And Lord God, we just ask that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to all that you have for us through this passage. Lord God, just speak to us. Um, encourage us, convict us. Um, Lord God, just show us what you have for us this morning. This we ask in your name. Amen. Now, have you ever felt forgotten? Have you ever felt that you were left to fend for yourself by either your family, your friends, and maybe even by God? In 2 Samuel chapter 9, we are introduced to a man whose name is Mephibosheth, and who can identify with this sense of being forgotten. Now, Mephibosheth was a descendant of King Solomon. Um, he was king, actually not King Solomon, he was descendant of King Saul, and he was King Saul's grandson. And he now finds himself living off the kindness of others in this place called Lodabar. And it seems that he is all but forgotten, and he could not have foreseen the favor that he would soon receive by the order of the new King David. Now, an examination of this story and in this passage that we're looking at that unfolds between King David, Mephibosheth, and Ziba in 2 Samuel 9 verses 1 through 12 provides some pretty incredible insight on the unforeseeable favor of God. Now, a little bit of context before we get into our lesson today. Now, 2 Samuel chapter 4 tells us that Jonathan, who was King Saul's son, and you probably discovered some of this in the daily Bible readings this week, if you do the daily Bible readings for the um, lesson. But anyway, Jonathan was King Saul's son, and he had a son who was lame in both feet. Now, Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, so he was the grandson of King Saul, who was the first king of Israel. Now, Saul and Jonathan were killed in combat. They were killed in war. And it was leave, left the throne to be occupied by David. Now, David was, called, was, was um, God's chosen king to succeed King Saul. Now, in those days, a new king, when a new king came on board, was usually, he usually staked out his territory by eliminating the family of the previous king. So King David, though, he had no intentions whatsoever of following that tradition. But Saul's family didn't know that. So they hurried to escape. Now, of particular concern at that time was five-year-old Mephibosheth because with the deaths of Saul and Jonathan, he was the presumptive heir to the throne. Now, if David did intend to murder Saul's heirs, this boy Mephibosheth would be the first on his list, according to tradition in that time. So the family basically got out of Dodge. But in their haste of getting out of Dodge, Mephibosheth slipped out of the arms of his nurse, and it permanently damaged both of his feet. So for the rest of his life, he would be a cripple. Now, the story of David and Jonathan is one of great, great friendship, and I encourage you to read it in First and Second Samuel. But they were besties. So today we would say they were BFFs. Now, Jonathan went to great lengths. Jonathan was King Saul's son. 
him and David were besties. Jonathan went to great lengths even to protect David from his own father, King Saul, who tried to kill David, knowing that he was God's chosen next king. So he basically betrayed the trust of his own father. And David promised and made an agreement that he would look after Jonathan's um, children long after he was dead. And that's exactly what David did. So in 1 Samuel chapter 18, we read about David and Jonathan forming this agreement. And in this agreement, Jonathan was actually to be second in command in David's future reign. And David was to protect and care for Jonathan's family. Now, in our Precepts for Living background, it tells us that, you know, David was at the height of his reign. He was at the height of his power when Jonathan and um when he found out about, you know, when he was inquiring about any descendants of Jonathan, he was basically at the height of his power and at the height of his reign. But you know what? He remembered his close friend, Jonathan, and the agreement that they had made. And though Jonathan was Saul's biological heir, he recognized, you know, Jonathan recognized that God's hand was on David to be the next ruler. Because technically, Jonathan was in line to be the next ruler. But he he recognized God's hand. And so this devotion to Jonathan that David had continued long after Jonathan's death. Our lesson is in three sections today. David inquires in 2 Samuel 9 verses 1 through 3. Mephibosheth appears before David in 2 Samuel 9 verses 4 through 7. And then David establishes Saul's legacy in 2 Samuel 9 verses 8 through 12. Our study guide has both the New Living Translation and the King James Version Parallel, and I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. So um, grab your Bible or your study guide, and let's jump in to David inquires in 2 Samuel 9, verses 1 through 3. One day David asked, Is anyone in Saul's family still alive, anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? He summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked. Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. And Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Now here in our study guide, it tells us, you know, King David was a fierce warrior and he was a very capable administrator. But King David was also a kind and a just king. So David wanted to honor the agreement and the promise that he had made to Jonathan. And he wanted to treat Jonathan's family with a faithful love. Now, once he was established in his reign as king over Israel, David inquired about any descendants of Saul. And it says here in verse 3, to show God's kindness to them. And David asked Saul's land steward, Ziba, who informs him that one of Jonathan's sons is still alive and it says that right here in our verses now and it, his name is Mephibosheth now unfortunately Mephibosheth it says in our scripture here that he was crippled in both feet now since Mephibosheth was only five years old like I mentioned earlier when his father Jonathan was killed and David was in exile during that time he didn't know anything about Mephibosheth so David's inquired about the descendants of Saul demonstrates this, his profound devotion to Jonathan and his memory. But you know, it also reveals something about David personally. You know, he had achieved great success in his reign, and he still felt it important to show kindness and to honor his agreement with his bestie, Jonathan. Now, on the surface, though, you know, David's desire to show this love and kindness to anyone in Saul's household might seem a little crazy to some because there was a time when Saul was like a mentor to David but then Saul turned on him and even tried to kill David on several occasions yet David makes it clear here in verse 1 that this is not about Saul or his remaining descendants but he was showing kindness right here in verse 1 it says for Jonathan's sake so Jonathan Saul's son he had become a confidant, he was a friend, and he was like a brother to David. Now, let's look at our next set of verses in 2 Samuel 9, verses 4 through 7. Mephibosheth appears before David. 
Where is he? The king asked. And Lodabar, as Isaac told him, at the home of Machir, son of Amiel. So David sent for him and brought him from Machir's home. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, Greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Now here in our study guide, it tells us that upon learning about Mephibosheth's whereabouts, David sent for him at once. And Mephibosheth appears before King David and he bows out of deep respect for the king. And Mephibosheth is afraid, but he's afraid with good reason. Because remember, it was customary for a new king to wipe out any remnants of the rival dynasty. Now, maybe Mephibosheth was aware of the tumultuous relationship between his grandfather Saul and this new king David. We don't know. You know, maybe he was wondering why he was there. You know, did David intend to kill him to ensure that there were no other members of Saul's family to contend with during his reign? We don't know. But given the history of Saul's family and David's family, he's probably thinking the only rational reason to be summoned before the king was for David to eliminate Mephibosheth as a potential threat. Now, David tells Mephibosheth, though, not to be afraid because David intends to show kindness to honor the memory of his father, Jonathan. Now, our commentary here tells us that Saul's family estate had likely fallen to David through his wife. Um, at one time, David was married to Saul's daughter. And so David intends, though, to restore all of Saul's property to Mephibosheth and offers him a place at the king's table. And Mephibosheth's response is one of humility. He's pretty humble. And Mephibosheth realizes that David summoned him so he could honor him and restore his family's land. He, Mephibosheth, is a beneficiary of a pact that David had made with his father years before. Now, let's move on to our last set of verses. In 2 Samuel 9, verses 8 through 12, David establishes Saul's legacy. Mephibosheth showed, bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba replied, Yes, my lord the king, I am your servant, and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. From then on, all the members of Ziba's household were Mephibosheth's servants. Here in our study guide, you know, it says here that restoring Saul's family estate was an act of extreme kindness. David, and David doesn't stop there. He establishes a means for Mephibosheth to collect an income for years to come. Now, David appoints Ziba, the land steward, to manage the land for Mephibosheth, and Mephibosheth would be honored like one of the king's own sons. Finally, Mephibosheth also had a son, and this son would carry on the name and preserve the memory of David's dear friend, Jonathan. You know, the favor, the favor that Mephibosheth receives from King David is in many ways just unforeseeable and may even seem irrational to some people, but you know what? It is not inconsistent with the power and the unusual ways of our God, our Almighty God. You know, but we must always remember, though, that some of what we receive from God is not about us. Um, but, you know, some of what we receive from God are the fruit of seeds that have been planted by other people who were used by God. Now, moreover, though, when God finds favor or when God's favor finds us, 
it may manifest itself in seemingly crazy and unexpected ways. Now, in our discuss the meaning here in our study guide, it talks about, you know, this passage describes an extraordinary turn of events for Mephibosheth. He was a recipient of a restoration so profound that it forever changed his life and that of his descendants. And you know what? As illustrated in this passage, God is the God of radical restoration. God seeks to restore individuals, communities, and the world through Jesus, through his free gift of salvation, through his grace and his mercy. And in our liberating lesson here, look with me here in our study guide, the story of David and Mephibosheth is a story about kindness. It's about restoration. It's a story about justice. And you know what? Similarly, we too can show God's kindness and justice to the world around us. David's kindness to Mephibosheth was rooted in relationship. So how will you, how will we demonstrate kindness and justice to those around us? bringing them into a right relationship with us and then pointing them toward a right relationship with God. How will you do that? How will we do that? And look with me in our activation, application for activation section. It challenges us to look for opportunities to show the kindness and justice of God. How will you do that? Look for those opportunities. You know, God cares deeply for the poor and the marginalized. And Mephibosheth was physically impaired, but you know what, there were, there, there, there were several people groups in those days that were marginalized. Or we have several people groups in our um, world today that are marginalized. We have women, ethnic minorities, the elderly, the poor, people suffering from mental illness. You know, people in numerous other groups can be marginalized as well. And our application for activation here challenges they need to receive God's kindness and they need to receive God's justice. So how will you do that? How will you share Christ with those? How will you show God's kindness and justice to those people? Let's pray. Lord God, we just give you all the honor. We give you praise and we give you thanks. You are a kind, a just, and a merciful Father. Lord God, cause us to see those who need to receive your kindness and your justice. And then give us hearts to demonstrate and show your kindness and justice to the world around us. Amen. I will see you guys back here at 9 a.m. We are going to worship and we are going to praise our good, our just, and our merciful Father um, with our Victory Praise Team. And I will see you at 1030 a.m. for either in-person worship at 2131 8th Street here in Sacramento, California. Or I will see you through Facebook Live. And next week, our lesson, December 19th, is going to be Justice and Righteousness Reign. And we are going to be in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. So your background reading for next week is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. You guys be blessed, and I will see you next week. You guys have a blessed and a wonderful week. Pray for me, and I will be praying for you.